Hello, listeners. This is your kind and loyal unpaid audio editor speaking. This episode of Red Star Over Asia is split into two parts. This is part one. For more information about the situation in Myanmar, please check out our show notes for this episode. Thank you for listening. Hello, welcome to Red Star Over Asia. I'm Ori, uh, one of your co-hosts for today. Uh, and today we have a very special guest, Jeff Aung. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. Really appreciate it. Jeff Aung is a PhD candidate at Columbia University for Anthropology, and he is joining us for today to discuss uh, the mass resistance in Myanmar to the Junta's coup and uh, the recent developments and uh, Myanmar's political history, etc. Uh, we have some questions prepared, and we're really excited to have him on and discuss the these events and see if we can identify or navigate some possible avenues for international solidarity, uh, whether that be between Korea and Myanmar or even elsewhere as well. Let's go through our other co-hosts. Jay. What's up? Jack. How's it going, comrades? Mike. Hey, how y'all doing? <laughs> Uh, Jeff, I think it would be interesting for people. Can you talk a little bit about your personal background and connection to Myanmar, Burma? Um, so you're uh, studying Burma, at Myanmar academically, as we mentioned uh, before, but you also have a personal and family connection there. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's it's also it, it's important to to have those kinds of statements. I think because it's important for people to know kind of my my position and where I'm coming from on a lot of this. So. Um, my um, my father's family is is from my father was born in Rangoon as it was called in English at the time. Um, my fa- I have kind of I have family in Yangon. I have some extended family um, in Pokoku in the north and Molomyan in the south southeast. Um, my on my father's side they they came to the U.S. not long after um, General Ne Win seized power in 1962. So they were sort of early political exiles, and um, my dad kind of um, kind of grew up in many ways. I mean, finished high school in the states and and um, lived in the states from that point on. And I was born uh, in upstate New York. And my grandmother, more so than my dad, actually, um, was very active in the kind of exiled political world. Um, she passed away a few years ago, but she was part of. Um, she helped found the CRDB, the Committee to Restore Democracy in Burma, which was sort of like an early, um, early kind of exiled political institution that ended up having kind of quite close relations with the the NCGUB. There's a whole alphabet soup, as I'm sure you can imagine. The NCGUB was the National Coalition Government, the Union of Burma, which following '88 was the was the exiled government. Um, so the, I mean, these were these were kind of DC world. Um, institutions aiming to um, as, to restore democracy as, as the name of the CRDB um, promises they were they were very much within a sort of liberal democratic kind of political um, political world uh, and and that was that was sort of how I uh, came into contact with a lot of this stuff I mean um, in high school uh, I started going to sort of um, rallies conferences, Mainly at that point with the U.S. Campaign for Burma, which um, had ties to the kind of student movement after '88, ties to the NLD, the USCB, I think, is a is an organization um, that has tried to do good work over the years. I like like other people, I think I, I have maybe disagreements with with some aspects ultimately of, of how they've operated. Um, I think uh, the kind of exiled slash sort of international advocacy scene kind of world has done some good things. 
Um, for me, interestingly, they, they've, they've oftentimes kind of politicized kind of business and, and, and companies doing um, kind of investors in, in Burma and Myanmar in a way that I think taught me maybe fundamentally about the, the kind of the politics of, of, of capital, capital investment, capital flows. That I think was sort of formative. On the other hand, uh, I've it's I've been frustrated to see the degree to which I mean I think particularly after nine eleven, particularly with kind of Bush era democratization kind of stuff, um, a lot of advocacy groups have proved, in my opinion, all too willing to kind of build ties with neoconservatives, um, with people on the kind of far right of the political spectrum in the U.S., which is already to start with pretty far right. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that was sort of, that was, I, I feel like I've kind of tried to unlearn some of what I learned at that point over the years. Um, but uh, eventually I, I started doing some work on the Thai Burma border where there's um, kind of a, for, for quite a long time after 88, a couple decades basically, and still to a degree, um, quite a lot of in- interesting organizations, kind of activist groups. You have kind of exiled democracy organizations. You have more like left-leaning groups working with uh, Burmese migrant workers. You have also kind of large international NGOs doing humanitarian work in the refugee camps along the border. There's still um, still 10 refugee camps along the border. Um, so that, I think, I, I started to develop a kind of different political sense of things once I was working there. Um, a little bit more, more grounded, I guess, um, to put it in simple terms. And then I moved to Yangon when when things started changing um, after 2010, 2011, um, and spent a couple of years working there as a as a researcher before grad school. Um, so that that's that's kind of where I where I come from. I I suppose um, I still am a little bit partial to some of the kind of exiled political groups. Um, but uh, so I mean, it, there's always this question of working through. Um, uh, the liberal democracy, right, and and what that means for um, for maybe someone who who might think a potentially more radical political paradigm might be necessary or important. Um, I think in a place like like Myanmar, at least, one is constantly confronted with sort of what to do about about this this question of of, of liberal democracy and its relation to these kind of struggles that we see on the ground. But that's that's. In um, some sense, that's kind of where I come from, I guess. So today is actually the recording, when we're recording is April 16th. And April 16th has been for the past seven years, a very tragic day. It's the anniversary of the Seoul Ferry in- sinking, the incident. And at that date, over 140 people drowned in the sea. And the government was completely uh, unable to rescue people properly and it has been a series of series of inadequate uh, uh, investigation into the causes it has been a, a big deal of political controversy and one surrounding social uh, catastrophes but so and Jeff also wrote in his recent piece for M plus one dead generations, he spoke of the Azani, the martyr. And I think there are resonations between the two in that, uh, people died while well, tragically young. And then the years passed and we have these moments of remembrance of trying to politicize those deaths. Uh, I, Although these are completely, starkly different situations, uh, I was wondering if Jeff could speak more about this tradition of how uh, people in Myanmar remember those that fell before them and uh, what kind of social practices, social traditions of that, the political meanings of it, if the ten- the tensions within it stuff like that i hope i hope the question got across yeah thank you yeah that's that's a really really um kind of interesting and powerful uh, place to start i think um i would say that one thing i've found um i've found myself drawn to over the past um 
I guess, two and a half months now, something like that, since the coup in February, has been these kinds of practices um, uh, related to memory in some sense, which in some cases are, are fairly, you know, maybe straightforward where um, kind of shrines uh, spring up where people have been killed. Um, this, this happened from the very, very beginning. I mean, from the, the first young woman who was killed in, in Nebida, um, and then in quite a few subsequent cases as well, um, sort of informal sidewalk shrines. It's often often in the streets, as we know, where, where in the streets, broadly construed at least, where a lot of these kind of confrontations have taken place with cops and soldiers. And so you see candles, pictures, flowers, um, and people kind of gathering to, to remember that person in, in one way or another. But there have also been... Um, attempts to connect these deaths to um, other deaths in the past, right? So um, there is this kind of, this notion of the, of the Azani, as you say, of the martyr in kind of Myanmar political thought, um, going back to, um, well, it's, <laughs> it's a sort of flexible and, and open tradition if we want to think of it that way. So I'm, I'm not sure that we could point to a, a kind of um, formalized, kind of canonized um, um, sort of, list of, of martyrs in that sense but um, some of the some of the sort of more widely uh, kind of remarked upon or remembered martyrs are people from the kind of anti-colonial struggle um, like Bo Ang Jha, whom I wrote about um, but probably the most famous group is the group that were assassinated um, uh, just a few months before independence including Aung San, who is, of course, widely remembered as kind of leading um, independence hero in, in, in Burma. Um, and so when people have died recently, there have been these um, sort of small piecemeal, but I would say nonetheless kind of noticeable attempts to kind of rework or restructure some of these genealogies, if we want to think of them. Genealogy, not in like some complicated academic way, but genealogy in the sense of a kind of family tree, right? A kind of connection between individuals over time across different places that have um, some sort of inner resemblance. Um, so you have people who remember those who've been killed recently as explicitly as, as Azani, referred to as Azani, um, not not exclusively as Azani. I mean, to, to some extent, people have been referred to maybe a little bit more commonly as um, just kind of heroes or um, the fallen. Um, but this term Azani has cropped up quite a bit. And it immediately calls to mind um, not only Aung San and, and his colleagues who were, who were assassinated that day, but also people like Bo Aung Jha from the freedom struggle as well as people um, who died subsequently. So people uh, who died in 1988, for example. Um, Win Ma Wu is one of the more notable examples that I, that I mentioned in that piece as well. Um, so there, these kinds of, um, these memories of, of people who have passed away um, in kind of moments of political struggle uh, tend to, well, I'm tempted to say they they recur in these kinds of moments of crisis. I'm I'm not sure I can actually uh, actually claim that just in just in the sense that I'm I would have to do more work to see about like let's say in 1988 whether or not kind of similar practices happened and um, I would I would imagine that the kind of term Azani would have been used quite a bit in 88 as well but I'm not actually sure so I can't say that definitely. Um, but at least in this moment, um, these these memories have kind of loomed large. Um, and so there's been this kind of, um, again, in a, in a sort of loose and informal way, what I see at least as the construction of something like a revolutionary canon or, or, or a, a group of people um, who've given their lives in, in um, insurrectionary struggle of one kind or another. And I find that to be a, one of the more... Um, powerful aspects of the the current resistance it's been um it's been sort of difficult to to follow the news in, every day in in some ways um but one thing that i find i i suppose some kind of solace in i don't know if that's quite the right word but in there is this way in which it seems that people who who kind of who whom we lose in these moments return as as kind of as incitements to struggle, um, as 
kind of inspirations for ongoing mobilization of one kind or another, which is to say that um, those who've those who've died recently are perhaps in, in some ways still with us in, in a kind of political sense. And I, I like to think that that might sort of allow us to maintain some sort of forward vision in a way um, where this kind of ongoing struggle maybe can draw on some of this uh, kind of inspiration from the past. That's sort of how, how I see it, I, I think, for the moment. Um, maybe, maybe one slight distinction would be that it, it is very clear that in the, in the kind of Azani tradition, if we can think of it that way in, in, in Myanmar, the martyr is someone who has sort of knowingly, kind of actively um, chosen uh, the, the sort of confluence of, of politics and sacrifice. It is someone who has kind of knowingly risked everything in some sense. I don't, I don't know if, if it, so I don't know how that might compare to the ferry incident, um, for example, where um, we might find something more like innocent bystanders in, in some sense. But I do think that uh, there is this question of people who've died and, and, and how to sort of remember them and, and kind of integrate them in kind of ongoing political struggles, uh, which strikes me as a, as a sort of important um, kind of practice in moments like this, for sure. Yeah, sure. I, I just would want to follow up with the remark that uh, this sort of, the, the reason why Jeff, your piece really resonated immediately with me was the, it's the same set of questions that I've been trying to ponder with, and it was just much more better articulated. Uh, I mentioned before that, so there are several days that where we remember our martyrs and this sort of having, uh, remembering martyrs and what they struggled for, whether that was conscious, consciously done politically or unconsciously and trying to create some meaning out of their lives and deaths uh, is, is really central to social movements in South Korea to the extent that every single rally, every single protest, everything that has some sort of connection to a deeper tradition of social movements start with the song uh, Marching for a Beloved, which its lyrics explicitly st state that the deaths are leading us to our elevation or emancipation but i really liked how that wasn't done in a passive sense your piece our remembering and their deaths were done that everything will be okay is a wager it's a non-teleological view of history that we need to actively engage and intervene into history to make what their struggles were into reality and so certainly your distinction is very accurate. That is precisely the point of contention on politicizing these deaths and all the controversies surrounded. There is the view that this was merely an accident of the Seoul ferry incident, and therefore uh, accidents have happened every day. We need to naturalize it and, and disregard it. And then there are those that this was a death that could have been pre prevented, therefore the meaning of remembering their deaths is preventing that something tragic like that happens again. I guess this point of contention is just more starkly divided. I guess the junta would view these deaths as merely accidents of just natural incidents, whereas people who are actively struggling against the military, uh, the coup, would be trying to give grant meaning because at the end... If there was no change, then the lives would have been lost for nothing. But to prevent that from being lost to history, uh, as Benjamin said, those those whispers from the past are, are are still haunting us today, and we need that's that's precisely what we need to save. So it, it was a deeply resonating piece, and I just wanted to I wanted to mention that, especially since it was April sixteenth today. I guess we can move on uh, to, I guess, recent developments in Myanmar. Uh, you've already talked at length with Spectre. Uh, it's, it's a, it's. We'll, we'll link it in the disc, uh, podcast descriptions. But uh, that was, that was, that was in February, and now it's ap in mid-April. So uh, the death toll has risen significantly. I, I've last seen it in the seven hundreds, uh, which is a massive, massive toll. Uh, 
even exclude. I'm I'm thinking that's a conservative estimation because the military、uh, are hiding the bodies as well. So, and not every 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 death is counted properly, and it's probably going to be、uh, decades before we ever ever get to realize the full extent of of the massacre. But other than that, there there I've I've heard you mention recent changes in the forms of resistances.、Uh, I would. I'm also curious about the atmosphere of whether、uh, the the mass resistance is still en- energetic,、uh, feeling that they can see this through,、uh, win their fight, or is there some sort of、uh, withering out? Hopefully not.、Uh, about the responses from the ethnic minority armies,、uh, the emergence of the CRPH, the committee representing like. I don't. I don't know how to how to pronounce this. The Pudong Sir Zata. All right. All right. Anyhow,、um, yeah. Could, sure. Could you sure. Speak on that, please. Well, in in broad strokes,、um, as we know, right, in, in the kind of、um, the first weeks following the coup, we saw this these sort of this kind of mass upsurge of large, quite large demonstrations, kind of occupying major、um, urban centers. Um, there was this this very kind of festive mood that that tended to permeate these these events.、Um, these kind of large occupations were also combined, to an extent at least, with kind of tactical blockades on on trade infrastructures and trade routes. To an extent,、um, of course, this was all occurring against the background of of quite a significant、um, general strike as well,、uh, which began with public sector workers. Um, but but certainly it was not only public sector workers, and the strike was fairly、um, successful in in, in shutting down、um, quite large swaths of the economy. In more recent weeks, the security forces do seem to have been able to kind of reclaim at least central urban areas, which has shifted. Kind of recurring demonstrations into kind of tighter, more residential areas, where among other things, it's possible to build kind of stronger barricades and maintain more disciplined formations.、Um, as a result of which, as kind of repression has followed,、uh, there have been some kind of standoffs in in certain areas where、uh, it's been kind of difficult for kind of one side or the other to make too much headway. Um, frontliners have spoken of plans to try to retake major urban centers, but that hasn't really occurred so far. Instead, what we've seen is、um, quite a, a kind of scaling up of, of bloodshed and kind of、um, urban peripheries.、Uh, so some of the like Langdaia, for example, which is the largest, has the largest concentration of factories in Myanmar,、uh, North Okhotpa, which is another industrial district.、Um, And we've also seen sort of urban, sorry, rural areas, kind of in some ways becoming perhaps a little bit more important as well, as kind of cops and soldiers have managed to、um, kind of maintain some control over central urban areas,、um, at least in, in in the south, for example, where where I work,、um, Dewey Town is one of the main towns there, and Dewey Town itself.、Um, Which saw very, very active, very militant、um, actions and demonstrations for for quite a while. Barricades,、um, like really、um, kind of militant frontliners. It's been it's been pretty quiet lately. There have been still some some strikes and demonstrations, but、um, what has what has been interesting has been a, a kind of upsurge in marches and demonstrations and strikes in the surrounding villages, which I wouldn't necessarily have foreseen.、Um, And we've seen also、uh, kind of an uptick in military actions in ethnic armed areas. So there have been airstrikes, for example, on the territory held by the Korean National Union, which is an armed group that's been fighting the central government for for generations upon generations. Something like twelve thousand people have been displaced, according to the KNU Thai government.、Um, really, really shamefully, has been kind of fencing out refugees. Although there's been more of an accommodation around humanitarian aid now, as far as I understand, but we've also seen、um, protesters from kind of central urban areas looking to take shelter、um, in some of the kind of highland border areas with armed groups, which is a, a kind of complete replay of the dynamics following the '88 uprising as well, where
um, kind of student protesters from the center um, kind of go to the peripheries. Um, so there have been there have been reports of um, people training with kind of firearms, hand grenades, learning about things like kind of tactical strikes on military facilities. Um, a lot of discussion about a kind of broadening armed struggle potentially. Um, it's important to remember that there has been armed struggle happening um, since even before independence. Um, so armed struggle is not necessarily something new here, um, but there is potential maybe for a sort of broadening of, of that kind of ongoing armed struggle. As you say, the, the CRPH, the committee representing the Bidang Su uh, has uh, assumed, um, let's say, uh, in some ways, a more a more sort of prominent uh, position now. I mean, they, they've been they've been prominent for for a while, to be honest. But just today, they they announced the formation of a national unity government. To be entirely honest, I'm still kind of catching up on the news on that. Um, but what I understand is that the CRPH that that in 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 announcing this national unity government, they are formally claiming the existence of an alternative government, which until now they actually haven't done. Um, not in that way, at least. And this national unity government, moreover, um, appears at least uh, to be more inclusive than than governments past. There appear to be there appears to be kind of strong um, leadership from uh, ethnic minority areas uh, at, at the kind of upper levels of this national unity government. The National League for Democracy, which of course was in power for the past five years and is the party led by Aung San Suu Kyi, is uh, in many ways a, a very sort of Burman um, kind of bourgeois nationalist party. So the the CRPH, which consists of the formerly consists of the elected MPs from the last election, is kind of mainly NLD people. So there there was always a risk that the CRPH in kind of kind of developing an alternative government would sort of um, replay some of the problems that the NLD has kind of um, encapsulated for a long time, which is to say sort of um, kind of Burman chauvinism from the lowlands, right? But it, it seems at least, the, the, initial, the initial kind of um, news seems to be good that, that this is maybe a more, a more inclusive kind of political, um, political vehicle at this point, this alternative government. And I, I hope it is. I would only, I would only add that, um, well, I would say even for someone like me who's, who's a little bit kind of inclined to be skeptical of sort of formal political institutions in some sense, I, I do think it's it's exciting news. I, I hope that I hope that maybe it, it offers some uh, kind of energy and and, and um, uh, inspiration for people, sort of ordinary people who've been continuing to defy the military. Um, but I, I guess I, I would say that I think even even something like this, we have to always think about well the, these sort of for let's say these kind of like relatively high level kind of elite. Um, somewhat abstract formal institutions constituted in this case in many ways at at a kind of international level um i.e through a lot of uh kind of discussion and debate with um people in the in the kind of so-called international community how much how much traction does something like this actually have um it seems to me that if kind of mass defiance in in the streets uh in some way is not maintained then something like this um, could easily fall very flat. Uh, so I, I, I hope it's, I hope it's a good sign. Um, but it, it's been a little bit quiet recently in terms of um, kind of demonstrations and protests. I mean, part of that is because it's, it's, it's the new year, and it's, it's Thinjan, which is um, kind of usually a time of, of uh, celebration, and, and um, people are off from work and, and having massive parties and, and throwing lots of water on each other and dancing, lots of music, all of this. Um, uh, suppo- people have kind of um, kind of informally declared Thinjan uh, canceled this year, or, or at least kind of reconceptualized as a, as a revolutionary Thinjan, um, as the phrasing has gone on social media, at least. Um, so uh, it's, there have been some, some kind of, um, some demonstrations and marches in the last week or so, but it's been a little bit more quiet because of that, I think. And we'll see, we'll see how things kind of go from here. I mean, it's, it's good to have an alternative government. Um, again, I think without, um, 
if people aren't able to kind of keep the streets, uh, then I think it, it might it might not be too successful, but I hope it will be. So um, you just mentioned that in Myanmar, the question of how to kind of transcend and go beyond sort of bourgeois liberal democracy um, is a very pressing one given the National League of Democracy, which is that kind of like more mainstream bourgeois liberal party kind of uh, dominates the discourse to some degree, at least in like... I don't know, maybe more complicated on the ground in Myanmar, but what we see abroad uh, in the media is that, you know, uh, Aung San Kyi is portrayed as this sort of like heroic kind of saintly figure and the National League of Democracy is this, you know, brave, valiant force that, you know, you can't possibly criticize them at all. I think that that facade has faded a little bit with the Rohingya question and the more exposure that that has gotten uh and the uh, National League for Democracy's complicity in that. But um, our question is, so you mentioned uh, in the interview that uh, Bori mentioned before, the Spectre interview, which we will link in the show notes. It's a really interesting read that in Myanmar, there's a very diverse composition of the resistance um, uh, politically. Uh, and and, and as, as you touched on before, ethnically as well. There's another kind of interesting analogy with South Korea where – here, there was also a long period of military dictatorship that also uh, provoked a diverse kind of popular front resistance. And at that time, the question of how to transcend and go beyond kind of just liberal parliamentary democratic norms into and try to pursue a more radical project was a difficult question that people were grappling with there and uh, that people in Myanmar seem to be grappling with as well. So there's... There's always a lot of tension and instability when we have these large popular fronts of liberals, radicals. If you're dealing with a multi-ethnic country like Myanmar, that adds to the tension. And so these kind of broad coalitions can become very unstable. So uh, what do you think about the resistance movement in Myanmar? Do you see any sort of like fault lines emerging within the resistance along ethnic lines or class lines? Uh, how do you see this stuff playing out? Um, do you think it's going to be difficult for the resistance to kind of hold everything together in this popular front formation? There are so many fault lines. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so many fault lines. The, I think I would say the fault lines have not so much um, kind of uh, emerged in, in, into view in, in, in recent months so much has been the, there, there are things that um, have kind of um, structured – political life in, in Myanmar for generations upon generations. Um, so they're, they're sort of built into um, the very starting point of any sort of political project, um, whether large or small in many ways in, in Myanmar. Um, but some of the more obvious ones, I mean, as you say, I mean, is, is uh, the question of sort of racialized ethnic difference between kind of the lowland Burman majority and, and, um, I think minority groups in the kind of highland border areas. Um, there are certainly religious differences as well. Um, um, kind of a lot of people in, in the lowlands are, are Burman Buddhists. Um, a lot of people in the highlands are, are Christian. Um, uh, and as you say, with the uh, Rohingya, with the kind of ethnic cleansing of Rohingya in, in Western Myanmar, um, there is a whole question of the kind of the the kind of current life, political life of Islam in, in Myanmar as well. Um, so th there are as well. I mean, wh wh where to where to go? Where to stop? I mean, class class differences as well. I mean, um, I think it is important to remember that this kind of mass resistance did, in many ways, start with a general strike. Um, started with uh, kind of health workers. Um, but other public sector workers as well, people working in banks, um, uh, railway workers, uh, shipyard workers, um, and then of course the the industrial workforce in in Yangon, uh, which is small. I, I I don't have the numbers at the kind of tip of my tongue, but presumably small relative to let's say perhaps other countries in 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 Southeast Asia. Um, but is, uh, has been uh, hugely significant in terms of kind of swelling um, some of those demonstrations early on. Um, I think we, we would have to point to um, questions of, of gender as well. Um, something like 
80 plus percent of uh, workers in low wage light manufacturing are young women from largely rural areas. Um, so when we speak of the industrial workforce having been um, in many ways the backbone of, of urban resistance early on, we're talking um, about mainly sort of young women from rural areas. Um, as well, we've seen uh, really powerful um, uh, kind of women leadership um, among kind of ethnic minority groups who've been quite active in, in this ongoing resistance. Um, some of that, I would say, is part of a longer tradition of that it's to an extent institutionalized where a lot of uh, kind of ethnic civil society groups, there's very strong um, women's organizations so groups like the Karen Women's Organization, the Shan Women's Action Network, um, they're, 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 these are quite strong organizations. I wouldn't put it entirely down to that, but, um, but there is this kind of um, history and precedent for very strong kind of women's leadership in, in ethnic areas. Um, I think at the moment, the, the kind of key fault lines are <laughs> these, but not only these. They're, they're kind of institutional ones as well, right? So... Um, when we think of the kind of amorphous, kind of large, sometimes smaller demonstrations and protests and strikes and marches, these tend to be um, kind of considered roughly under the heading of the civil disobedience movement, the CDM. Um, and then there is, as we've discussed, the CRPH, the committee representing the Pidong Su Um There's also the General Strike Committee. There's the General Strike Committee of Nationalities. Um, there, there are more as well, um, but there are certainly tensions and instabilities uh, uh, within and between each of these institutions. Um, the national unity government um, right now, there again, uh, this was sort of announced today, so it's difficult to say too much at this point, but there's a lot of optimism, at least, that it appears to have kind of addressed the question of ethnic inclusion relatively well. Again, I, I hope that's the case. Um, there, there is, uh, as one would expect, a kind of difficult history of, of kind of um, attempts to forge unity among um, ethnic armed groups over the years. Uh, so for those of us who, who spent time on the Thai-Burma border, um, where these, these issues tend to be maybe a little bit more front and center than in Yangon, for example, but kind of in the border areas, one always hears and hears repeatedly about um, one or another attempt to form a sort of alliance between armed groups that would then sort of take on the, the lowland military more effectively um, over, the, over the years. Um, these have always, uh, let's say, in- encountered many challenges and difficulties. Um, it's, there haven't, it hasn't really come off um, for various reasons. I mean, some of these reasons are are good, you could say, I think, because there's a lot of diversity among, as again, as we would expect this as well, there's a lot of diversity among these different kind of ethnic armed groups. I mean, some of them uh, have um, more or less sort of uh, left-leaning political traditions and others are more or less right-leaning. Um, some are quite involved in um, things like uh, kind of extractivist projects, whether that's sort of uh, mining, um, jade, timber, um, or, or different forms of agribusiness, so kind of agro-industrial plantations, palm oil plantations. So, I mean, when some organizations uh, don't want to kind of line up with, with other ones, there can be sort of good reasons for that. Um, nonetheless, uh, uh, this, this, kind of, this kind of recurring attempt to form s- some form of unity. Um, uh, well, it's 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 been tried many times. I I hope it, I hope I hope there will be some success here. I, I do think that this kind of unity is a is a term that is has carries a lot of weight in kind of um, conventional political discourse in in Myanmar. Um, I I do find it I in, I find it in some ways to encapsulate some of the some of the um, some of the shortcomings or challenges maybe of, of political life in, in Myanmar where, where this kind of push to unity or this kind of rush in some ways to unity, this reach for unity, I think can be a little bit of an exclusionary process historically. So 
um, in, in many ways, unity has been a term that has been um, kind of uh, uh, kind of sought on the grounds of kind of Burman Buddhist chauvinism, right? So to be unified is for other people to sort of accommodate themselves to um, a kind of Burman Buddhist political project. Um, I hope that form of unity is perhaps we're, we're starting to move beyond that. Um, I guess we'll have to see. Um, I, I prefer, this is just me as someone who's quite far away with maybe a slightly different political vocabulary, of course, but I, I prefer to think in terms of solidarity, which I think is possibly a more promising um, kind of political concept, but uh, admittedly um, debates over political concepts are, are a bit abstract. Um, so it, I'm, you know, let's, let's see what happens with the national unity government. And again, um, you know, whether to what extent kind of ongoing mass defiance on the ground is maintained and these, these things will have to kind of play out in coming weeks. So we talked about fault lines. And so on the other side, then, is there any uh, sort of dissent, whether, uh, organized or individual, uh, any significant dissent within the military itself, or is it, is the entire military firmly united behind the coup government? For example, in case of South Korea, the 1979 to 1980 coup by uh, General Chun Doo Hwan was at first met with um, uh, resistance from certain commanders and units and could not command the support of the entire uh, military at first until uh, un- it took it took them several weeks and months until it could totally control all the military. So I was wondering whether uh, the military is uh, united in this coup. At the moment, it seems like it is. Unfortunately, there have been some cases of defections, but quite quite limited in number. And in some ways, I I, I think the amount of attention those that kind of small number of defections has received is sort of an indication of of how unusual they are because they there have there have been sort of a few high profile defections um but but not of sort of people at, in the upper echelons of of the military unfortunately um yeah i mean the, right so i mean within revolutionary histories of one kind or another i mean defections from um, the security forces are are tend to be sort of crucial moments, right? And at the at this point, it's difficult to foresee too much of that happening. I hope that changes, but the military historically is an institution um, that is quite strongly integrated. It is also um, sometimes referred to as a state within a state um, when it comes to things like schooling, um, even uh, residential. Uh, residential arrangements, people within the military um, sort of live their lives in many ways quite separate from the wider kind of wider society in, in Myanmar, which which helps to sort of um, maintain this kind of high degree of internal cohesion. I've I've mentioned uh, in in kind of other interviews that that the police is a different kind of institution. Um, the the police uh, is not as kind of hermetically sealed off from the wider population as the military. And there have been um, quite a few defections from from the police in recent months. Um, A lot of police uh, have crossed over to India, actually, to kind of seek asylum. There were a few in in Dewey in the south as well, where I work. Yeah, so I mean, there might be something a little bit more, um, more promising in those directions. But from the military at the moment, it's it's hard to see. Unfortunately, I, I hope that changes again. But you know, for people like us, maybe or, or people on the ground, kind of looking from the outside in at the at the military, you could imagine how um, it's obviously a very kind of stratified hierarchical institution, and and one would think that people who are not in the shop might kind of look around and, and see this institution as perhaps, um, you know, not really uh, serving their, their interests or, um, but uh, yeah, at the moment, um, yeah, there hasn't been, there hasn't been kind of serious defections from the military, unfortunately. Been calling the military government, you know, fascist, which is, I think, uh, very reflexive when it comes to, you know, mili- militarist and authoritarian sort of governments. Whereas, you know, in the past and to a degree, I think, uh, right now as well, 
the military government has uh you know called itself you know socialist uh in the historically uh and considering the discussion you know like on you know up until like last year a lot of people called the trump government fascist as well in in america uh and there was a lot of debate on whether that's an ad- adequate or appropriate terminology uh, or whether it serves any purpose in our analysis so uh con- considering these kind of things how do you think sh- we should approach this kind of you know designations and labels when it comes to this uh coup government in Myanmar and Myanmar military as a whole so uh reflecting on uh i guess Korean discourse about fascist governments fascism was used to just describe the military dictatorships and it was used as a rallying cry for social movements and resisting it and then there are there have been certain tendencies within uh contemporary social movements that wanted to uh kind of frame the conservative governments as fascist as well and then i was on the side that saw that that was that was losing too much analytical value and that if if you start calling these conservative governments fascist and uh all liberal governments become fascist and and if you, you can you can make a case for that of a certain fascist tendency or liberalism allowing fascism to strive and be them being two sides of the same coin but uh equivocation uh is also very tied to uh political action on how to deal with the ruling government and I, and i guess that is also regarding to how how more radical leftists relate to the question of liberal democracy whether you just view them any reactionary conservative elements within them as simply fascist or you play that this is what how liberalism functions i guess the the question of fascism in within Myanmar is more stark and easier to rally behind because it's actively seeking out and killing its civilians but i guess the the reason i i i wanted to uh add a comment was how does that tie into with if it exists the radical left in Myanmar's uh and its relation to liberal democracy i do think that fascist and and fascism i i think these these are for me at least these are terms that are kind of um sort of living and breathing in in kind of everyday political life and and are subject to redefinition and reuse and kind of redeployment and and kind of specific situations in a way that for me at least and this might be my kind of like anthropology hat on or something i'm i'm a little bit less interested in in kind of defining a, a kind of ideal typical notion of fascism that can then be like correctly applied or not applied in different situations for me i'm more interested in how this term seems to get reappropriated at different points and gets used as as a form of um uh something that helps to mobilize or inspire people on the ground for me that's more sort of more interesting but i i would say that um there i mean the, even even at the level of sort of of even at that kind of definitional level i mean there's more than one definition right i mean I, this is not my my expertise or anything like that but from what i understand if people want to think in terms of a of a kind of um i mean to an extent people tend to turn to the history of fascism in europe right and look towards a, a unity there's that word again between kind of industrial and military forces in in a given setting right but i mean uh there've been alternative definitions right i mean cesar talks about how fascism was born in in the colonies and so the the sort of the kind of conflagration of the second world war was in many ways the sort of boomerang effect of of a kind of long history of colonialism and i mean hannah arendt later picked up on that as well I think Jonathan Saha is a guy in, in the UK, a professor who's who's written about this in a really interesting way recently. I mean, I think in kind of whichever definition one wants to use, we do see a certain at a certain level a a, a kind of um a kind of unity between industrial and military kind of fractions where certainly the military is is sort of front and center at the moment but um the military has long relied on not actually well sort of long i mean over the past 30 years or so since since the period of kind of um very state managed market transition in the in the, starting in the early 1990s a kind of flexible and to some degree changing group of 
national entrepreneurs is sort of the polite term for them. The less polite term is, term is kind of crony capitalists. Um, so kind of uh, tycoons who are close to the military um, and built up uh, conglomerates in the private sector. Um, and they've been, they've been quiet uh, lately, as, as one would expect in, in this situation. But the kind of degree of cohesion between um, those kind of people and, and the military has been, uh, has been pretty tight over the past 30 years. And so, I mean, if one wants to think in terms of um, that kind of strict definition of, of uh, military industrial kind of, uh, kind of unity, then I think that does apply. But again, for me, it, it's it's more it's I'm I'm a little bit less interested in that sort of strict definitional work, and um, I I it does seem like this word or this term um, has a has a kind of liveliness to it that that people pick up and use in in kind of productive ways, and that's that's that to me is is you know is pretty interesting, and and, and I think that is happening now. So for me, it's, it's, it's interesting to see how people are kind of like maybe redefining fascism in a way, um, even if, even if um, you could say it already kind of meets that earlier definition. I completely understand the, the context. Uh, some, some of my radical left friends in, in, in the English sphere might scoff at that idea and uh, vouch for more uh, openly communist or socialist uh, veneers, but it's it's we're operating in different contexts uh and th- those practices need to be assessed within within those specific contexts and i i don't think it's and i i i completely agree the, the reason i posed this question in the first place is because like i at least the impression i got from the limited knowledge i have of myanmar is that the questions posed on how to relate to liberal democracy seemed much more close I see much more, a lot more resonances than than example than the usual examples that we, the left or progressives, seem to find in, say, uh, Western Europe or Northern Europe or the U.S. So, I, I guess that would also tie into a post-colonial uh, condition or uh, the, the the what position each uh, country has in 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 the global order of countries of states as well. These these are all very vague questions, vague questions at the moment. But that's that's another big question. It's a question, as I kind of suggested earlier on, that I think um, uh, is is a little bit of a difficult one to to parse. Um, so there, I mean, there's a few there's a few issues within that, right? So first is uh, what is what maybe the, what are the contours of radical politics in one sense or another in, in Myanmar and what is the relationship between whatever that is and, and liberal democratic politics or thought or visions. I mean, so, so even um, maybe if, if we think about where we might, uh, the, the kind of usual suspects for kind of radical, radical politics, right? I mean, if we think about um, kind of labor politics, for example, um, the trade unions, um, large and small, um, the, the larger ones are very sort of within a kind of tripartite um, kind of negotiation model at this point. Um, there, are, there are smaller unions that are um, more likely the, sort of working at the enterprise level that, that um, are more likely to pursue kind of wildcat actions of, of maybe a slightly different political nature. Even, but even kind of like labor activist groups. Um, I'm thinking of one in particular. Uh, uh, they, I mean, I, I would say they're they're doing kind of really interesting and, and promising work. Um, but even they, even they will sort of run a lot of their activities through, let's say, kind of human rights trainings. And what do we, what, what do we make of that, right? Yeah, so I, I'll, I'll just make some quick remarks and stop hogging Jeff all to myself. But uh, first, the, uh, the the three finger, uh, thing is, uh, what do you call it? The the sign, the the action. What do what the gesture? All right, sorry. So it, it's it comes from a very uh, liberal kind of Hollywood movie. Yet it's been taken up. 
in radically different directions to the extent that you can't just entirely explain the phenomenon of, I don't know, the Milk Tea Alliance or uh, in terms of, of, of the origins. But also, I'm, I'm thinking of two historical precedents in South Korean history. Uh, first, the 1980 Gwangju uprising. It wasn't taken up in the ideology of uh, socialism or communism. It was taken up in uh, the fulfillment of liberal democracy. So it was it, it's this inspiration of how could the government uh, start shooting its own civilians. Uh, we need to reach out to the U.S., and all these uh, harbingers of liberal democracy to save us. But that became like the liberal democracy's promises, trying to fulfill that to the end, created a moment where people uh, talk about analogies to the Paris Commune, that there was a brief moment where Gwangju became a commune, a radical collective experience uh, of uh, radical equality. And the second was uh, up leading to the 1987 democratization movement. Uh, it, it was initiated by the death of a student activist, Park jong Chol, And the reason why it, th- that death resonated throughout all of society, especially with white collar workers and the middle classes, was because Park jong Chol was seen as an innocent student who was really hardworking uh, maybe have met the wrong seniors and was led into uh, avenues that he shouldn't have done, uh, gone into, but nevertheless didn't deserve to die through torture and through blatant lying by the government. But the truth was that Park, Park jong Chol was a committed Marxist-Leninist. But that history was hidden, and precisely because of that reason, uh, the ideological con- uh, the conjuncture was able to function that the masses really went out to the streets to protest against the government. So it's not always the case that the language that we speak holds to the actions, uh, as, as Jeff already mentioned. So, so I guess these, these questions pondering upon me, are uh, how to translate and reinvigorate the project of communism in the 21st century after the fall of socialism, at, throughout the authoritarian regimes that have been nominally socialist uh, under uh, blatantly denied histories, as in South Korea, very anti-communist regimes from the start. Uh, how, how, to, how to formulate, articulate these projects? I, and, and I think these are the resonances I find when hearing about uh, the Myanmar's political situation, but also with Hong Kong, uh, when they are resisting against the Chinese Communist Party, this this gives you very little space to maneuver when you're a radical leftist, uh, and everything is blocked out by uh, liberal democracy. So the impression I got from your interview with the final straw was an uh, optimistic view that the situation in Myanmar could become revolutionary. If this impression is justified, um, could you expand on your assessment? Just the discussion in the interview then turned to how unity of the military had to be broken and that in Myanmar, it was rather the police who was more likely to break off while the military ranks were more tightly sealed off from the rest of society. No, no I, I think, I mean, one, one jumping off point, right, maybe a sort of obvious one is that there, there is a, a certain history of, of socialism in, in Myanmar, right? And this is a history that's um, directly tied to authoritarianism and and um, as a result of which, it is it is difficult in some ways. I mean, if, if you were going to um, uh, be sort of, let's say, organizing rallies or, or demos using kind of um, explicitly socialist language, I, I, I do think that would attract some some kind of like raised eyebrows. And, and I mean, in, in talking with um, kind of friends and and um, friends and family in in Yangon, I mean, there is this kind of sense that. Um, well, no, you know, I mean, socialism, like even even more than socialism, leftism. I mean, this is something we tried, and um, it was a disaster, or something like this. Interestingly, I I, I think um, I find that communism has has like a, a somewhat different uh, uh, kind of uh, historical. There's a there's a different kind of historical memory of communism. I mean, there's a decades long communist insurgency um, that was for a long time maybe the the sort of main threat to the to the military i mean socialism this is one of the uh, socialism in in myanmar was was anti-communist right 
Um, and non-alignment as well from the standpoint of um, uh, Burma's post-colonial political leaders, non-alignment was, we think of it as, as sort of a third world political project, which it was. Um, and we think of it as maybe being, um, having some connection to anti-capitalism, maybe anti-imperialism. But I mean, there was a kind of anti-communist strain there as well, right? I mean, this is part of, was part of non-alignment as well, even though the relationship between Russia and China and non-alignment was, um, was sort of interesting. But, um, but the, the military government was, was anti-communist. And I think in part because of that, in the South, for example, um, where the, the Communist Party had a relatively strong presence um, there's, there's kind of quite fond uh, memories of, of, of kind of communism as a, as a project. It's something that people kind of joke about, that or people are happy to talk about. Um, when, when I kind of press friends there on, on things like um, one of the groups I work with um, does a lot of work around kind of large scale development projects and their whole kind of, a lot of their uh, sort of political language and, and kind of the kinds of demands they're making, kind of transparency, accountability, local participation and decision making. Um, and I'm always kind of like, you know, why, why use this, this kind of avowedly liberal language? Like, why not um, explore maybe a more directly kind of leftist uh, political language? And, and so then we, we, we sometimes get, get talking about kind of communist histories in the South. I mean, the, the Communist Party was also uh, in some places in the early nineties to the extent that it still existed in some places, I mean, it more or less collapsed in the late eighties, but there were still vestiges in the early nineties. There were kind of good relations with some of the kind of student fighters that emerged after 88. Um, but, but part of the reason why, um, I mean, there's a couple of factors, right? So the history of socialism is a kind of difficult history and the, the official history of socialism is a difficult history in Myanmar. Um, there's also that whole kind of, you know, the 88 uprising took place at a certain political moment, right? I mean, this was a moment when, um, more or less around the fall of the Soviet Union, um, this was the, the sort of infamous kind of end of history moment, right? This was the moment where liberal democracy supposedly becomes the, the kind of singular political horizon for all, um, politics, um, I mean, and then, and then again, the kind of post 2011, uh, kind of Bush doctrine moment as well, um, where there is, there, the, there's kind of, I would say there's kind of two big funding streams that, that go into, um, kind of civil society groups on the border and in Burma. I mean, one is your kind of OSI funding and, I, and I, so there's like kind of OSI funding and then there's sort of NED kind of NDI kind of U S government funding or other from other Western governments. Um, so some of this comes from a sort of neoconservative democratization paradigm. Others, I would say OSI traces more to that kind of post-Soviet period. Um, I think like you, I, I think it's, it's, uh, it can be difficult to, I mean, cause I don't want to entirely sort of reject um, this kind of politics because it is the sort of most direct and explicit kind of ground or, or, or uh, imagination maybe through, through which people are kind of making sense of their political worlds at the moment. Um, at the other, on the other hand, it is also the case that we're seeing um, kind of shifting material conditions. Um, we're seeing this kind of moment of mass resistance that's grounded in a general strike. Um, we've seen the economy more or less shut down. Uh, we've seen these kind of tactical blockades of trade routes. Um, I would argue that there, there is, even, even if, you know, the, on one hand, there's the question of, so what, what is the language people speak, right? I mean, and, and so maybe that language is, in a, in a direct way, the language of liberal democracy. Um, but we can also follow kind of what people do. Um, and we can follow... Um, what people do in relation to kind of changing material conditions and perhaps see um, maybe a slightly different trajectory. I mean, it's, it's often said, uh, well, not super often, but I've seen the claim made um, somewhat regularly that, that there's almost this kind of entire absence of, of class politics in, in Myanmar. Um, and on one hand, I understand that because there isn't a lot of, um, along the lines that we're discussing, I mean, there isn't a lot of explicit discussion of class. Um, on the other hand, um, class politics is everywhere, right? I mean, it's, it's a class politics when, 
um, the earliest demonstrations against the coup were were kind of massively run, <laughs> organized, and and kind of swelled by the industrial workforce. I mean, that's that's a class politics. I would argue it's a class politics when there's tactical blockades of trade infrastructure. Um, class politics need not always speak its name in that sense, right? I mean, so uh, you know, <laughs> there, there's all, all those kind of debates about ideology, right? And and um, I don't I don't know if we like totally need to get into that. Um, but I do think that there's a way where um, even though we don't see a lot of kind of um, kind of kind of direct left leaning political language, I mean, um, in terms of what people are doing, I mean, you see it everywhere, right? Um, and so one need not necessarily worry so much about the kind of formal political statements in one way or another. Just just to just to kind of kind of point that out. I, I'm tempted to just make one, just one more remark. Is that sorry, but the the language itself also uh, inhibits how far the movement can go in certain ways. Because uh, I think a lot of leftist analysis of South Korea's current uh, uh, conjuncture or its uh, predicaments come back to that moment in 1987, where because all the radical energy was spoken in the, in the name of liberal democracy and liberal democracy was formally achieved. Therefore, all that energy of that tying between the middle classes and the labor movement was dispersed and all centered into the fulfillment of a liberal democratic state. So because that moment has passed, uh, there is no need for all those radical social movements anymore. And you can see that explicitly in how the Moon government, the current administration, functions with all of its members having been, at some point, student radicals, but are now just espousing economic liberalism. And uh, so I guess, uh, although although the conditions vary very much, there is also a case to be made for that a language that a class politics in its name might be needed as well, and it's it's a point that I'm I'm I have no position uh, very strictly upon, but it's it's a very it's an impasse I find myself in, and I and I wonder how comrades in other uh, Asian contexts ponder with that question, because I think that's the commonality of of first century communism. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's important to remember that the military is is a large institution, but obviously relative to um, sort of the country as a whole, it's 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 trying to kind of cling on to power in a fairly desperate manner, right? I mean, this was always kind of a debate, you know, for the last 20, 30 years was um, how much power does the military really have? And, and there, there were a lot of people who argued that it had maybe a kind of high degree of Kind of concentrated course of power in, in some instances, but was otherwise otherwise had sort of low infrastructural power in the sense that um, it it its power did not sort of emanate um, kind of widely at all actually, um, and that in sort of vast swaths of the country the military had actually sort of no power whatsoever. You could argue that that's the case in a lot of kind of highland border areas, but even um, huge chunks of kind of rural rural Myanmar as well. Um, so I, I think. I think it's it's important to remember on one hand that the military is kind of definitely like has its claim on power at the moment, but um, that will always be um, it's it's it. I mean, it does look tenuous. Um, I don't think of myself as a as a particularly sort of um, optimistic person, and uh, generally speaking, but I mean, if there's any sort of um, scenario where where one could imagine the fall of the fall of a regime, I mean, it seems to be. I, I think there there is promise in the, in the current moment. I think maybe to an extent, going back to the previous question, I, I do think maybe it's worth asking. And this is also a question of this current, the, this kind of national unity government that was just announced. Um, what what is, what do we mean by a, a kind of revolutionary situation, right? So, I mean, on the one hand, um, this is a kind of a situation where people are sort of calling for the fall of the regime, right? But what comes what what comes after that? If if it's not too soon to ask that, which maybe it is. For example, um, we've seen 
in, in just in the last two or three years. I mean, we've seen kind of um, uprisings and insurrections take down um, a bunch of governments across the world. Um, not only the, the last few years, obviously. Um, I think maybe we could say that the record has been sort of a little bit mixed in terms of what has followed that process, which is not to sort of criticize those those struggles necessarily, but just to be a little bit honest. I mean, in this case, for example, um, it is partially that question again of, of kind of liberal democratic demands, because the demands here have been things like for federal democracy, for the abolition of the 2008 constitution, um, for the release of, of all political prisoners, uh, all of which I'm, I'm personally fine with admitting are, are important demands. Um, I, I have been sort of wondering whether to what extent we might start to see maybe in, in, a, in a kind of simple sense, more economic demands, demands that might be targeting, for example, um, the military holding companies, uh, which control major portions of the private sector, maybe demands related to land reform. Uh, there were a couple of land laws passed in 2012 under the, the sort of so-called democratic government, which have been um, huge disasters for the kind of rural rural poor. And um, so maybe, maybe there could be demands around uh, sort of repealing those or, or sort of broader land reform effort. There hasn't been um, this sort of discussion yet, um, even though... As I said, I mean, there there is this background of of a, of a general strike, right, um, and the shutdown of of major pieces of the economy. Um, we haven't really seen at the level of of kind of political demands going forward. Um, a, let's say kind of democratic claims upon the economy. Um, we've seen democratic claims upon the kind of formal political sphere. Um, so I, I think the the revolutionary situation that presents itself is one tied to overturning the current regime. Um, I do think that, uh, you know, in the sense of a sort of broader social revolution, um, there's more that we might want to think about than just that. Um, but needless to say, um, that is, a, that is a, pressing, a pressing urgency at the moment as well. And I do think that, um, uh, that, that it's, a, it's, it's a possibility, at least. I, I think, I personally think that especially for, for maybe people in the diaspora, people outside the country. Um, I, I think it's important to recognize that possibility. Um, it's, there, there are all kinds of reasons that, that one might look to the military and, and um, quite understandably see how they've been able to maintain power for long periods of time. Even the, even the preceding 10 years um, arguably came from a, a a process kind of stage managed by the military, right? Um, so we shouldn't, we certainly shouldn't underestimate the ability of the military to sort of hold on to or, or even sort of change the form in which it holds power. Um, but uh, surely, I mean, with, with these kinds of, um, I mean, with what we've seen over the past few months, I do think it's a possibility at least that the, this current resistance could move beyond that, that kind of that military power. Um, I the uh, <laughs> I qualify that by saying that prediction is always um, uh, is always really dangerous. Um, I I personally don't always find it very convincing when people kind of predict one way or another. The only thing that that I would that I'm sort of willing to hold to is that whatever we might see kind of going forward, I do think will depend on the ability to kind of maintain mass defiance in the cities, towns, and villages. Because um, I do think without that. Than the this kind of national unity government or perhaps other forms of um, work at the international level, whether it's uh, intervention of one kind or another, R two P um, Security Council action, these things I, I think wouldn't have very much traction at all uh, if it's not possible to maintain that sort of open defiance in the streets. That's sort of the the one thing that that I would hold on to. Um, I don't know if that's kind of optimistic or not. I mean, maybe it is. <laughs> Some people have kind of suggested that lately. Uh, but um, I, am, I am willing to kind of hold to that position at least. That wraps up this half of the episode. To hear the rest of the conversation, please check out part two. Oh, <laughs>